Good afternoon. I'm Michael Barr, Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. On behalf of myself and Ann Curzon, Dean of the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and my co-chair for the Democracy and Debate Initiative, we want to welcome you all for today's session, American Democracy, the Path Forward, a conversation with Governor Jeb Bush. Our program today is part of the University of Michigan's Democracy and Debate Initiative, and the Ford School's Conversations Across Differences series. I would like to thank the Tuft Family Foundation for their support of this important work. I would also like to thank the members of the Ford School staff and Governor Bush staff for their work to make this event possible. As Dean of a policy school named after President Ford, I'm particularly pleased to welcome Governor Bush to the Ford School. The Ford family and the Bush family have long connections friendships formed by the close professional and personal relationship between President Ford and President George H.W. Bush. Governor Bush has a long history of public service, including as Commerce Secretary of the state of Florida, and notably serving as Florida's governor for two terms, from 1999 to 2007. He was also a Republican candidate for president during the 2016 race. He now serves as the chairman of the Board of Excellent Ed, a nonprofit organization that seeks policy solutions to increase student learning, advance equity, and ready graduates for college and career. Governor Bush and I will be in a conversation, and then later in the program, we'll be joined by two Ford School students. Bianca Shaw is a current senior in the Ford School, focusing on health policy. She serves as the government relations coordinator for U of M Central Student Government. Bianca is from Maryland, and she has advocated for youth and the South Asian community. Michael Hauser is a first-year master's student at the Ford School, focused on global democratic resilience. Prior to graduate school, he attended the U.S. Air Force Academy and spent nearly eight years as an active-duty Army infantry officer. After graduation, he hopes to continue serving as a State Department Foreign Service officer. Now, let us turn to the conversation. Governor Bush. Welcome to the Ford School. Good to be with you, Michael, and, and it's a real honor to participate in anything related to the, the Ford School and, and President Ford. I'm, I, I was always a big fan. Well, thank you, Governor. As I said in the introductions, I'm especially aware of those connections between your family and the Ford family, the shared value of public service, and I think our shared striving for politics uh, better than we have today. Uh, yeah. So I'd like to start really with that family legacy. Your family has a, an extensive uh, record of public service. Your grandfather was a U.S. Senator. Your father was the president, vice president, representative, ambassador, director of central intelligence uh, for President Ford, our, our namesake. And your brother was, of course, president. Uh, you were uh, quite a, a distinguished governor and a leading figure now in education reform. I, I wonder if you could reflect on how that family legacy, how your father's model of public service might have influenced your own uh, uh, ma mode or method or values in public service? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Michael. I, first of all, I, I need to have an addendum to the Bush involvement in politics and public service because uh, my son, George P., is mm -hmm. a two-time elected official in Texas and now running for attorney general in a mm -hmm. contested primary. And my my first granddaughter, who's named whose name is Georgia Helena Walker Bush, we call her 41 because she has the same initials as my uh, beloved dad. She's run for office from mm -hmm. second grade on. She's a fifth grader. Um, she's won twice and lost twice. So that's great. She's overcome all of the you know the the anxiety of running for office. And she's she's a really mighty fine president of her fifth grade class at the Montessori School down south. So um, I don't know, maybe it's a contagion that uh, or it could be part of our DNA. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, in my case, it was uh, a campaigning for my dad in 1980 and then the Reagan Bush campaign. Uh, I overcame all of the kind of 
most people think politics is really weird and they don't want to have much to do with it. But if you get involved in it, um, you realize it's pretty purposeful and mm -hmm. it can be fun. It's not always mm -hmm. terrible. Uh, and so I overcame some of my trepidation about it. But my main interest was to repay my dad, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, uh, mm -hmm. to get involved. And then when I saw the potential as Secretary of Commerce of the role of governor, particularly, mm -hmm. uh, I was motivated to, to serve uh, because um, inspired by my dad in every way. He's, he was the greatest man I ever met. And um, it, it wasn't any three point plan that drove me to this. It was really um, inspired by a phenomenal guy that I miss a lot, actually. Yeah, I, I could see that in the way that I've seen you talk about him before and, and, and the way you're talking about him now. And I didn't get a chance to work with him, but uh, I've heard from many people, both Democrats and Republicans, what a fine uh, human being he was to work with. Well, Michael, you know, um, I know that you worked uh, in the Clinton uh, administration and much to the chagrin, at least I, I will have to admit this uh, personally for me. I was a little surprised that my dad befriended uh, the guy that beat him mm -hmm. in 1992. And that friendship really became really, re really important for my dad and certainly for President Clinton, who I saw a month ago. And um, he's whether he likes it or not, uh, we've adopted him in our family. <laughs> and so restoring some degree of that notion mm -hmm. that if, you know, you can fight the hard fight in politics and in the policy world, um, but, you know, you can you can also be a friend. And, mm -hmm. and, and so somehow we've got to get back to that. I was I was talking to a congressman, I won't name uh, name him, uh, but he said that Republicans and Democrats in Congress don't even talk to one another. They don't even actually know each other. They don't know who their spouses are. They don't know what their you know background is particularly. Um, it's not necessarily that they're the enemy, but mm -hmm. you know there isn't that connectivity personally. And it's pretty easy to demonize people you don't know. It's really hard to do it if you have a human connection, right? I, I think that's right. I, I want to. Uh, focus our conversation a little bit next on some really, I think, very difficult moments right now for the Republican Party. We're going to talk some more about Republicans and Democrats together, but focusing on the Republican side for a bit. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Representative Cheney here um, uh, in conversation with Representative Dingell. Uh, and as you know, Representative Cheney has been censured by the Republican Party not for her political beliefs, which are quite conservative, but because of her desire to support the investigation into the attack on the Capitol back on January 6th. And I'm wondering if you could reflect on the Republican Party's choice to censure Representative Cheney, how you think about that, um, what, it, what it might tell us about you know, where we are as a country. Um. Well, first of all, I, I think it's always important to have a historical context. You're part of the academy and a sense of history should be an element of everything you guys do. And this is not the only time in American history we've had strife. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were reflecting on this when we had our uh, pre-call. Um, I grew, I went to the University of Texas, graduated in 1973. And I can remember like the six or seven years leading up to that as being extraordinarily crazy um, with uh, just turmoil across the board, riots, uh, increased drug use, assassinations of incredible political leaders, a deeply divided country. Uh, Vietnam uh, tore the country apart in many ways. Watergate, you go through all of this mm -hmm. and, then, and then a ruptured economic system in the late 70s. That mm -hmm. was a tumultuous time. I'm not sure we're at the worst time in American history right now. So that, that would be my preface. Having said that, I don't want to discount um, this, this idea that somehow if you, um, you know, Liz Cheney should not be condemned. She should not be censured. She should not be kicked out of the Republican Party. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that a Democrat would have thought that Liz Cheney was just a knucklehead right wing <laughs> fool, <laughs> you know, and now she's, <laughs> now she's abandoned by the other knucklehead right wing fools like me, apparently, although I'm, I'm a supporter of hers and have written, uh, make contributions because I think it's important for 
people that kind of integrity to uh, to stay in the Republican Party. Um, but she's been abandoned and mm -hmm. it's wrong. Um, I don't I don't quite get the whole phenomena uh, of this new populism that is is been personified by President Trump, particularly. Uh, it goes beyond that. I think both parties now have a populist strain that um, is more that allows for more theater and less productivity in terms of public policy, implementation of policy. Um, but I admire, um, I, I love Dick Cheney and I admire Liz Cheney for the same reason. They're compass points north. They love this country. Uh, they're willing to take pay the price. Um, you know, a lot of scorn was heaped on her dad during my brother's uh, tenure, mostly by, you know, people in the other party. Mm -hmm. And now Liz is being scorned by people in her own party for standing up for what's right. And if we don't support people like that, what's next? You know, I, I, so I'm, it, it does trouble me. I would say that the, the state of the Republican party looks a little different when you escape DC, mm. where 60% of statewide elected officials, uh, more than I think two thirds of the state legislatures are controlled by Republicans. The governors, 33 of them, I think are Republican or 32. Uh, they wake up each day and, you know, they're figuring out how to accomplish an agenda that actually helps people. Um, so we focus a lot on too much on the louder voices in the DC, you know, the, the, those that tweet rather than legislate, uh, they get all the attention, but mm -hmm. outside of DC, it's not as crazy as it might mm -hmm. look. That's, um, that's certainly uh, a helpful frame. And, and we do, I agree with you, we do try and talk about historical context a lot in the Ford School. Uh, and I do think that our political discourse tends to be very, very foreshortened in terms of perspective. But we've been through some very terribly rough times in American history um, and, and have come out stronger on the other side. I think, yeah. uh, I, I, think, I, think I think they have the potential time. of doing that here. I, mm -hmm. I don't see the I'm, I'm not smart enough to know what good is going to come out of, uh, you know, challenging the basic essence of our election system and right. the things that um, continue where people feel either intimidated to to um, say things that in their heart they know is not right. I, I, I don't I don't understand why people feel compelled to do that. It's easy for me. I'm out of you know political life. You know, there's a there's a lot of pressures to conform um, because there's a lot of people really deeply disaffected and angry, and um, hard to reason with people when they're you know when they're acting on their fears and their angst rather than their hopes and dreams. How do you begin to change the conversation? When, when I look, you know, I'm I'm an outsider to the Republican Party. I come from a different political tradition, and so I. I may not fully grasp um, all of the nuance of what's going on internally in the party. I'd love a little bit of help thinking about this. So when you look at at President Trump's uh, brand of leadership, the populism that you described and his attacks on the on really on the democratic system, that's a very different model of governance from President Ford or 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 your dad or your brother in terms yeah. of how to think about leadership. So how do you, how do you think about pulling the Republican party a, away from that approach and towards maybe a, a more traditional model of governance? So I don't, you know, the question uh, that I think should be asked is how much of this is, is populism um, that is, that President Trump has accelerated, how much of his Trumpism that relates to him and him alone? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it relates to, I think the, the trends of polarization started long before President Trump arrived. The angst that people feel because of a changing culture and the disruption of economic policies that left a lot of people behind started way before him. Mm -hmm. And solving those things, I think, would get us out of this issue where, you know, we're, we're going to be constantly talking about the 2000 election, which by all accounts was a fair election. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it wasn't stolen. 
and there's no evidence to suggest otherwise. And yet we keep our, you know, candidates are forced to be able to mm -hmm. they, you know, torture themselves to get to a place where they think they get, you know, get a pass from uh, folks that now believe it was stolen mm -hmm. because President Trump insists on it. So I think that's my belief is that if we get back to problem solving, maybe recast the traditional conservative message to incorporate this this populist sentiment to be less about, you know, the perception at least of being you know, more about big business and things like that and, and, and be more focused on how do you allow, how do you give people a chance to rise up as they see fit? Um, how do you give them the tools to be successful? How do we create policies to make sure that, you know, our trade policies and our foreign policies are respectful of Americans in general um, that, that think that they're getting screwed? You know, if we refocus on that, I think Trumpism begins to die out. But if we're constantly mm -hmm. focused on, um, you know, the 2020 election, if that becomes the dominant figure, the thing going on in 2022, A, I think Republicans probably lose more than they should. It should, it could be a, it should be a really good year for Republicans at the national level and certainly at the state level. And it and will have a huge impact on 2024 as well. So. Part of this is a belief and part of it's my hope. I'm not sure which which percentage is what. Uh -huh. But I do think, look, I, I think our political system is broken for, for many reasons, perhaps. But it's not working um, because we haven't adjusted our policies irrespective of left or right. Our, poli our policy prescriptions are, they could be the same ones in many cases that were advocated 20, 30 years ago. And the world has radically changed. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, you take this. This device is a computer more powerful than anything we had 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Millions of people have it. Uh, the internet has changed everything. The the pace of of, um, of of the world is at warp speed, and we're still operating with a healthcare system, an education system. Michael, I'd say our higher education system as well. Um, how we regulate, uh, how we tax in many ways, how mm -hmm. do we, you know, just in almost every aspect, we're operating as though we were, you know, from a policy perspective, it was 1990. And I think that's quite dangerous. So mm -hmm. as a conservative that believes in the conservative philosophy, I think we need to, to advocate a 21st century version of that. And mm -hmm. I'll let the Democrats figure out how to do that on their side. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we, both sides do it, then I think people will begin to feel like the political system is starting to work for them. It's really hard in the environment that we're in to have the kind of substantive conversation that you just described, right? We're, we're in this environment in which people are throwing kind of invective at each other rather than focused on trying to think about substantive policy that might advance the public good, whether that's from a Republican position or a Democratic position. Yeah. We, we spend a lot of time at the Ford School trying to wrestle with this. We have a, an initiative we call Conversations Across Differences, trying to help people learn how to listen better yeah. uh, and hopefully how to talk in a way that lets other people listen to them when they, when they have these disagreements. And our, our society, our culture today is not really conducive to that with Twitter and with the invective you hear in Capitol Hill. How do you think we can begin to have a conversation that is focused on, you know, really substantive debates about whether it, whether it's tax policy or immigration policy or the other issues you, you laid out so my instead of just yelling at each other? First, I would suggest that um, your next speaker or the one after Liz Cheney is uh, try to get Amanda Ripley to come, hmm. who's written a book about high conflict. Mm -hmm. it, it's it, it's conflict itself is healthy. It's part of our democracy, mm -hmm. and without it, I mean, it, the, the, the democracy doesn't flourish. But high conflict is what we have today, which is is very dangerous. And so she's she's done a lot of research on this and written a phenomenal book about how you get out of high conflict. Um, and I think. Part of the you, you mentioned the most important part, which is listening, you know, um, and you can't listen over the Internet. Mm -hmm. it, this has to be personal engagement. And uh, my passionate belief is that we're a bottom up country 
the nature of our country. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason the Bill of Rights is is a incredible set of, of freedoms that is give freedoms from government effectively. Mm -hmm. The the left, the hard left calls those negative rights. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're they're in favor of guarantees of rights of housing of everything. Th these are rights to allow yourself to live freely, and to protect those things, you have to engage at a local level. I mean, the Tenth Amendment is a good example of that. I'm not sure why we outsource so many things that could be done in Lansing mm -hmm. uh, or Tallahassee or local governments that that right now are dominated by DC. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer, I think, is a bottom up approach. Um, rebuilding, reweaving the the web of civility and of uh, constructive conversations of conflict, but it done in in the proper traditional way, uh, done you know done done with conviction and passion, but done a thousand different ways across the country, and that's emerging. The interesting thing is, while while Rome is burning, you know, our DC is all screwed up, you know. Basically, it, it just looks ugly. There's a lot of places around the country, and, and you all are doing the same through your efforts at the at the Ford School. Um, there are scores and scores of, of examples of this where people are tired of this, and they're they're trying to rebuild our democracy from the bottom up. And I don't, I think that's the only way to do this. Um, to rely on the internet, you know, where you're anonymous, and you can rip the head off of somebody. Uh, without any courage, mm -hmm. uh, and never never meet the person that you're supposedly hating and tearing down is not going to be the answer. Or to reward politicians in D.C. who have don't even know what a conference committee is, <laughs> literally would not know how to actually take a like the little like the PBS deal of how laws made. Yeah. They would have no clue. <laughs> they can go on Twitter and rip you know rip a new one onto uh, one mm -hmm. of their opponents. And by the way, the other element of this that makes it quite dangerous is when someone who's really good at this on the left rips into someone who's really good on this in, in the right, they both win. Yeah. They both get more intense followers because everybody's going damn right. They don't convince anybody that doesn't already agree with them. They just create more intensity that makes it harder to reweave this web that I think is what we need to do that can only be done at the local level. How do you think... You know, as we're building up at the local level with this, it connects with this national conversation. You have, again, the current leader of the Republican Party is somebody who's not really that interested in reconnecting the fabric of society. Are there people in the leadership of the Republican Party or who could be leaders in the Republican Party who could present a different vision and then, you know, find somebody on the Democratic side who's willing to do the same and and change the conversation, or is President Trump's um, dominance in the party does that make it not possible right now at the national level? I think his he's he is a a dominant force. He's not the dominant force, but he's certainly a an important one. Um, I think it wanes over time, just as you know, it's a natural progression uh, of, of being a former. Your 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 influence does subside. Um, even even Donald Trump's, you know, who, who spends a lot of time still trying to create the environment where it's all about him. Um, but I do think um, there are ways to to uh, to forge consensus. I mean, my experience as governor was we passed a good year. We would pass uh, fewer bills actually than more, but assume for a moment we would pass on average 150 bills during our session. 140 of them were passed near unanimously. Um, and there was an effort, even though Republicans dominated during my time there, there was an effort to make sure all voices were heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was governor, the more provocative the idea, the more I tried to find, I, we used the term Nixon to China. Mm -hmm. It's better to find someone who doesn't look like me, who doesn't agree with me on 10 other things. Mm -hmm. On this thing, they agree with me, to have them be my partner mm -hmm. in advocating whatever it was that we were doing. And um, that's easier done at the local and state level than certainly Washington, where very little gets done. Regular order has been blown up. Mm. I mean, there is no budget process. 
there's no balanced budget. So there's no, you know, there's no forcing, like at the state level, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you believe in higher taxes or lower, at the end of the day, you have to have a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. And most, most states don't cheat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's pressures of pension obligations, other things that go along with it. It forces the conversation towards yes. It gets ugly, you know, mm -hmm. but don't get passed by June 30th a lot of times, but it works. And Washington, um, there are very few rewards for that. I'd say the one place in Washington where you could find uh, bipartisanship emerging would be if 10 senators or 12 in a, in a Senate that's as divided, you know, basically 50 50. You, if you had 12 senators, and I, you know, we can name them yeah. six and six, that just said on these five things, we're going to stick together. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to let the game be played the way it's being played. And we're going to solve these problems. The gang of 12 could actually probably dominate policy. Now, yeah. does that mean the House would go along with it? Um, maybe not. Does that mean President Biden should go along with it? Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he got elected to be that kind of president. And if he was given that opportunity, I think he would kind of default back or move back to the mean, which is his lifelong you know, career was one of, of trying to find common ground, mm -hmm. on, at least on domestic issues. So um, I think it's possible. And we've seen elements of this um, that emerge sometimes successfully, sometimes not. The infrastructure bill, which yeah. is the great success story. The only, I mean. Terrific success story. Well, that was that was the gang of, I'm not sure it was 12, but it was close to it. So yeah. 12 out of 100. Actually, just just uh, today, yesterday, the, uh, the governor of Michigan, Governor Whitmer, and the Republican legislature agreed on a quite significant infrastructure bill. Same thing, bipartisan basis. And it came out of committee on a unanimous vote. So I guess the principle, Michael, would be on the things you agree on, at least on the things you agree on, put aside everything mm -hmm. and come together. And then you can argue about the things you don't agree on, mm -hmm. go back to Twitter. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff where there's that is not as ideologically driven mm -hmm. um, and where there's an emerging view. I mean, in D.C., I'd say China now. Uh -huh. How we confront China, there may be variations of the policy, but... I think uh, there's a real belief that I think it was it was correct to assume, to hope at least that China would move towards Western values as they liberalize their economy. Well, in the last four or five years under President Xi, it's pretty clear that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, during the Trump presidency and the Biden presidency, the policy has been very similar and Congress mm -hmm. has been unified. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine's another uh, example varying versions of, of the, the support we need, but there's consensus. So, I mean, we focus on the things where there's big disagreements or the crazy stuff. I mean, there's there's some bad, you know, what crazy stuff that is like six people that are that appear more pro-Putin than pro-Ukraine. I mean, that's Nate, that's just, that's dumb. Uh, but they got massive attention, mm -hmm. massive attention. Uh, and so, you know, there's 95% of the Republicans that um, that had a different view. They got no attention. It's, uh, you know, so, so the focus is on the conflict and the controversy, not on the good government of bringing people together and forging consensus. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think most people are so sick and tired of the hyper partisanship that there could be an emergence of candidates uh, in both parties that say, look, I, I'm, I'm doing this because we have to solve these problems and I'm willing to, to figure out a way to get to yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you got Senator Manchin, gov I call him governor cause that's the higher job. Uh, he's, Fair he's, enough. he's in a position where he can do that. Um, mm -hmm. And others probably should, should, you know, figure out a way for them to play in that role as well. Um, and, and I think that'd be really healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll see. I'm, I'm I'm more heartened when I see what happens in uh, at the state level, where uh, there are interesting things happening in a much more bipartisan way. There's still there's still you know there's still the hyperbole, there's still all the issues, but in general, it's different than than what goes on in, at the nation's capital. 
Governor, you were mentioning to me the other day that um, one of the things you've been wondering about are the ways in which our culture and demography have been changing and how that influences what's going on in the political realm. I wonder if you could just reflect a bit on that. Sure. Well, de demography is um, destiny in many ways. And our demography has changed pretty dramatically, little by little, and now it's accelerated. So we're thankfully, as a as a you know Medicare beneficiary, I guess uh, you know we're getting a year from now. I'm, I'm, my plan is to be a year older, <laughs> and there are a lot of other people. It sure beats the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> my age, my age group, my people, my age and up uh, are the largest number that ever existed in, in American history. And so we are getting older and behind us, our children are not forming families to the extent that they once did. They're deferring marriage and they're deferring having children. And so you see a decline in the fertility rate, decline in, in, in uh, family formation. And so, you know, the dependency ratio, which is this nerdy thing of people up to 18, and people over the age of 70 now are, you know, unsustainable for everybody else in the middle. And politically, the people my age and up dominate politics. Mm -hmm. And there are very few people that advocate entitlement reform to be able to provide resources for those in the middle and children that need, you know, to be able to be equipped to deal with the world we're in. So. We have a $50 trillion uh, net present value deficit in our entitlement programs. And it's like Alfred E. Newman, if you remember Mad Magazine, it's what me worry. I mean, basically, you know, Alfred E. Newman is in charge of our ent entitlement policy. No problem, it's not gonna happen. Republicans and Democrats alike, based on this new demographic trend of not rebuilding the pyramid, either through a legal immigration system or a pro-family system that would create, you know, a, a rebuilding of the base. Uh, we it's unsustainable. It it will bankrupt us, and uh, it will crowd out all the expenditures that everybody wants, which is a strong national defense, homeland security, uh, basic public health care, dealing with the pandemic. All these other issues will subside because the automatic payments that are growing at a rate that is unsustainable. And no one is advocating changing that. No one that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I, I, I had a plan as a candidate for president. It got no, I mean, I supposed to be the third rail and all that, but no one really cared. It wasn't like it was controversial because I, it wasn't, you know, I didn't insult someone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, so I think we, we need get enough oxygen to talk about the policy because you were talking about the policy. Exactly. And then so that's one element that's really disturbing that we're not con dealing with. Those are those are facts. That's not opinion. And it changes um, how we, you know, the, the relationship we will have with our government. And the second is this big cultural change that my belief is the the biggest cultural change of the last 50 years was the you know, with the 60s created the so-called counterculture became the dominant culture with many benefits uh the ability of women to rise to you know still a long way to go i guess but but significant progress as it relates to civil rights progress as it relates to the rights of women though that all came from the counterculture of the 60s um and and the freedom to choose many different options in life you know, less constrained by convention. All of that created a burst of creativity and a lot of things, but it's kind of worn out its welcome. And, uh, and our culture needs to be reinvigorated in many ways. And maybe that's part of the solution of what you, what, you know, what you're concerned about is a cultural change may make it more possible to focus less on DC, more, um, you know, in our own lives, in our own communities, in our own families to, to find solutions that are whether they're on the left or the right, more bottom up. And it also could uh, change our culture towards reconciliation, towards this whole notion of, of uh, finding common ground, of creating a shared identity again, because we don't have that now. We used to have, I think, generally there was a consensus of what it is to be an American. And today I think that's in a deeply divided country. I'm not sure that 
one's definition is going to be the same than somebody else that has a different political view. If we could restore that and then have the debate in a more narrowed kind of focus, I think we would be, um, the restoration of democracy would happen quite naturally. So I think about cultural change more than I do, you know, the TikTok of the here and now in politics. Mm -hmm. And it's changing. I don't know where it's going. I told you I'd love to have the secret power to go four years or five years into the future and peek back to see what the heck's happening here. Mm -hmm. Because, and I think all of this, by the way, is accelerated with the pandemic. Just mind-numbing realizations of this conversation, you know, yeah. as, a, as, as a tiny example of it, but how you work, how you live, how you educate your children, how you receive health care. All of that um, was existed prior to the pandemic. The, the changes were happening. It's been the disruption has accelerated those things, some of which are going to be really positive for our country. But we have to change some policies to make sure that people can customize their lives now in ways that gives them purpose and meaning. Um, they can't be left behind because they don't want to work for the man, you know. Mm -hmm. Governor, you you um, you mentioned immigration as as one way to renew our our society and culture. Obviously, immigration reform has been stuck in D.C. for a long time. A, a lot of ways that we define ourselves as Americans, or at least used to, is as a nation of immigrants. Yeah. Uh, my my dad was an immigrant. I feel deeply about immigration policy. I know that's an area you've thought a lot about. What? What should we be doing uh, to move forward on immigration reform? Well, I wrote a book about this. I have to admit it wasn't a bestseller. It's called Immigration Wars. And it was written after the 2012 election where um, the anti-immigrant kind of feeling emerged um, more on the right than the left. But on the left, there's a politicization of immigrate, you know, of, of the immigration policy. And on the right, there's a, not across the board nativist, but there's a belief that we, um, at, at best, we need to fix the le illegal immigration policy, which I totally agree with, and change the laws as it relates to asylum. There's reforms that are necessary to, all countries should have the right to protect their borders. We shouldn't have an open, a de facto open border policy. And by the way, that's a winning political issue. That's a 75, 80 percent issue. And if Democrats are, you know, if they don't watch it, they're going to be they're going to be harmed by this because of the number of people that have come in, um, cutting in line of people who've waited very patiently in our legal system. Uh, I believe we should reform our legal system as well to make it look to take advantage of the the fact that we are a nation of immigrants and that. The, the, the vitality that, that legal immigration brings to our country is so exceptional and extraordinary and so much, it, it is, it's, it's, it's our one advantage that we have at scale mm -hmm. in any country in the world. And yet, you know, we're trying to compete in the world one hand tied behind our back with the current immigration policy. So there's common ground here, but mm -hmm. you gotta get past the, the, the argument of on the one hand, saying that there's, you know, civil rights for for immigrants to just cross the border, that they have the right to come. Um, it, it, you know, 90 percent of the people that come across eventually two or three years later because of the overwhelming nature of the number of people coming that have claimed asylum, 90 percent receive a deportation order because they, they can't prove that they have a well-founded fear of persecution. And none of them or very few of them actually will show up for the deportation uh hearing you know where they're where they're sent back so um that just you know that that's very upsetting and then on the other side we have people that are that are um send signals that are you know they believe that immigrants are not going to embrace the american ideal the american experience and that there's no evidence of this legal immigrants are you know create, they have less demands on government, they commit less crimes, they form more businesses, they are making uh, contributions, irrespective of level of income when they come, that, um, that pay their own way. And uh, at the high end, in the technology fields, it's essential for our continued superiority 
in the fields that are going to be the most dramatically impactful for uh, prosperity for the country. So, gosh, I mean, it seems, you know, we've been arguing about this now for 20 years and uh, we're not closer, we're further away from, from finding common ground. That gang of 12, whoever that, maybe a little more courage required on this one, but um, that would be a good place to start, don't you think? I think it would. I think it would. Let's um, let's talk about education reform, uh, and then uh, in a few minutes we're going to invite our students to join us. Sure. We spent decades working on education reform issues. We're coming out of a very rough period uh, during the pandemic that really disproportionately hurt low-income students and students from distressed communities economically, whether rural or urban. Uh, I wonder how you think about where we are and you know, as we're coming hopefully out of the pandemic, what what areas you think we should be focused on? Well, I think there are a couple of a couple of things that have happened. Parents are more engaged and more aware of their kids' education because they, in many places, they took over either as a partner with a teacher remotely or basically taking over the whole thing with very little interaction with the uh, with the schools. Um, and so there's there's heightened awareness, and that's good because ultimately any sustainable reform is going to require parental support and parental parental involvement. Um, the the pandemic brought out a couple of really powerful points, which is if you're if you're going to create a shutdown strategy to deal with a virus, you you need to focus on all of the impacts of shutting down the economy, shutting down schools. Uh, forcing families to be quarantined because the social costs of this are enormous. The learning losses are real. You can't automatically snap your finger and just automatically have those be regained. Um, was it, and, and, and you know, frankly, the, the more open the schools were in states like Florida, there's no evidence that there's a higher infection rate uh, that impacted teachers or impacted adults or impacted children than the ones that shut down and barely are thinking about coming back now. So um, hopefully we learn from these lessons and have a broader policy as it relates to future kind of crisis like this. The good news is per parents are now more engaged and more interested in, in, in having the ability to choose what's best for their children. So you've seen an increase in the number of students going to charter schools. You've seen an increase in the number of kids uh, that are homeschooled by a dramatic number and that's actually uh sustained itself after the you know the opening began and traditional schools have begun to see a decline so i think everybody has to realize in order to get the students to come back to their schools they're going to have to offer something that's more relevant for for parents point number one point number two there's a huge digital divide in our country and this became more apparent because of the pandemic part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, $40 billion is available to bring broadband into the urban core areas where broadband is too expensive or doesn't, it doesn't exist and into the rural areas where it's, it's very difficult. It, very you know, few places can you access broadband. And so that has to be done because hybrid learning is going to be a fact of life as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, our foundation is an advocate for a strategy as it relates to um, using this, the, the federal dollars to match with state dollars mm -hmm. and philanthropy to be able to eliminate the digital divide, which can be done if we were serious about it. It's one of those big, hairy, audacious goals that doesn't have the ideological tinge to it, mm -hmm. that could be done. And then, and then the final thing I'd say is that um, the, I'm, I'm passionate about early childhood literacy Mm -hmm. uh, there is enough evidence to suggest that there are ways, irrespective of, you know, when kids, when they start kindergarten, um, it'd be great to have uh, a pre-K strategy as well. But you can overcome these, these gaps if teachers are well-trained mm -hmm. uh, in the science of reading to teach kids how to read and a command focus on it. So by the end of third grade, they are um, basic readers rather than below basic readers. And, and that 
challenge is a challenge that's doable again if we're serious about it. And it would deal with a lot of the divides um, over the long haul if we if we at least started there. I, we, we work in 40 states, um, predominantly, you know, with conservative reform reformers. Mm -hmm. And there is a bipartisan consensus about early childhood uh, education being part of this. I just I think we should be have a little more edge to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't just say we're for it. We actually ought to have a gate that says if you're functionally illiterate by the end of third grade, um, you're going to be held back. Mm -hmm. We're going to make damn sure that we're going to develop another strategy to assure that your child can read before fourth grade starts where you're you're reading to, you know, to learn things rather than learning how to read. Mm -hmm. um, my hope is that that isn't, you know, that the unions get nervous about things where they're held to account. But in general, moms and dads know that their child has to be able to be functionally literate uh, by the end of third grade in order to be successful in, in life. So I think I think the pandemic has brought out some challenges that creates opportunities for policymakers. And and Michael, the good news is I don't think I mentioned the word federal government or D.C. in that whole diatribe. This is not a D.C. issue. Mm -hmm. and so it can be done. You know, they're very ver varying versions of what I just described that might be different expressed by a, a, a Democrat governor than a Republican one. But the action is done in, in at the state capitals where there is, you know, a broader possibility of consensus. I wonder, Governor, th there are these areas of consensus that I think are really important, but there are also at the state level some pretty serious areas of division. Yep. You know, I think how do you think about navigating that? You know, on the one hand, you have this potential for a focus on literacy and early childhood on education. But a lot of the heat right now is around things like banning the teaching of the history of racism in the United States or in Florida, even saying you're not allowed to talk about um, parents who are not traditional parents in in heterosexual families, you know, thinking about the concern about limitation on the teaching of either racial history or, or teaching about um, uh, gays and lesbians and alternative um, uh, uh, family structures or transgender youth. How do you think about how to have those conversations in a way that is uh, building consensus again and not in these very divisive um, modes of, of acting? Yeah, I mean, these are these cultural issues are tough for sure. Um, I, you know, I saw I don't know if you've read the veto message of Governor Cox from Utah, who uh, vetoed a bill that prohibited uh, transgender students to participate in women's sports. I, I assume it was just women's sports. Um, and, you know, his point was this. There are three. I think they've identified three uh young high school students that were in transition that were participating in women's sports but the signal this sends is to a much broader audience and that we should show love and compassion mm -hmm. and i you know he recognized the fact that um there ought to be rules around this issue and i don't think people disagree with that people you know there's a in fact the uh, olympic committee and other the ncaa they're they actually have crafted rules that would made it made it more difficult next year for uh, the, uh, the the woman that was that is in transition that became you know a collegiate record holder uh, who was on the male's pen swimming team last year and now is participating as a woman. So there are solutions to this, um, but it does require a little bit of humility and understanding and avoidance of these hot button issues where it's appropriate. So, you know, the should we talk about curriculum in schools? Should parents have some say in the curriculum of schools? I think that's an 80 for most people say yes. They want to know at least there should be transparency. But should we ban books? No, we shouldn't be banning books. There should be an allowance of 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 free expression. And as the older you go in the K-12 system, the more you have of that. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't want my grandchildren to be taught about sex of any kind. 
identification or preference or how whatever it is i don't you know in third grade i don't think it's appropriate and i think a majority of american parents would agree with that but there are a lot of places where uh, that are broader that i think the policymakers ought to focus on this rather than these hot button issues that are that are narrow you michael you brought up the uh, the impact that you believe is going to be of this uh, don't say gay it's called by the opponents of the bill i don't think that's going to be the impact um, it's, you know, unfortunately the language was vague enough for people to surmise what it might be. Um, but I, I, I think the principal objective of that was to say that, uh, that K through three student children should not be, uh, should not be receiving any information, um, about any of this stuff. That's the role of the parent. So we'll see how it plays out, but man, I mean, one bill of 500 that were presented to the Florida legislature probably got 90% of the attention and it was national. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are raising money on both sides of this issue uh, over the internet because it became one of those kind of cultural deals that dominates the political discourse in our country. Well, we're, um, that is a, 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 a deep and important issue. I think we're going to have to continue to discuss um, at another day because I want to invite uh, our first of our Ford School students to join us, um, uh, Bianca Shah. So, Bianca, do you want to come on in and, and offer up your question? Yes, of course. Thank you, Dean Barr, and thank you, Governor Bush, for being a part of this important conversation. So as was mentioned earlier, I'm a part of the Central Student Government here at U of M, and as a part of CSG, I've made efforts to increase civic engagement and student turnout through assisting and essentially navigating the voter registration and voting process. So as I've, I am an out-of-state student myself, I know firsthand that there's a lot of barriers already to voting, such as switching your voting registration, um, having different addresses each year, not having a state-issued ID, and more. And I work to promote the civic engagement as I want every individual's rightful voice on this campus to be heard, regardless of their party affiliation. However, throughout the country, we have now seen various voter suppression efforts founded on claims of voter fraud. These pieces of legislation often compound the diminishment of minority voices by disenfranchising black and brown voters. As voting is a key pillar of democracy, what measures should be taken to help thwart these targeted efforts and ensure that the right to vote is indeed a right for all Americans? So, um, uh, Bianca, describe to me the voter suppression issues that, that have passed in, you know, Florida was an example where there was a belief that that happened, or Georgia. Um, or Texas, what what are the elements of the of the bills that would suppress the votes? Since black voter participation in I don't know about Texas, but certainly Florida and Georgia is uh, has been at historical highs, and the amount of time available for voting prior to the election day uh, is longer in Georgia and in Florida than it is in Delaware where President Biden resides, or New York, or other states that are perceived to be more open for this. So there may be elements of the suppression that it would be helpful for me to understand, because then I could answer your question maybe a little better. Sure. So part of what I'm talking about is voter registration as it um, relates to mail-in voting, where a lot of people, because election is not a national holiday, people may have jobs where they're not able to get off to, uh, get off of work, especially if they work part-time jobs or jobs that have less flex flexible schedules. Or I've also seen legislation that limits what uh, election officials can actually do in terms of helping and staying open and different um, different policies such as that that relate to those days on actual election day. So again, the states that have been accused of suppressing the vote actually have longer times for early voting than, um, than many states uh, that haven't changed their laws um, and haven't been accused of suppressing the vote. So um, as it relates to um, one, of the, one of the challenges that has come up is that during the pandemic, we had extraordinary measures necessary to be able to have the vote take place in different uh, counties, because this is all administered by jurisdiction by jurisdiction, uh, unless you have a standardized state law, um, which Florida has had. I, I was governor in 2000, and we learned our lesson about decentralized voting rules, and so we created a, a single standard. 
But um, when you have executive orders done by uh, mayors in, in um, uh, one part of the state that circumvent the law to, to allow for what they believe to be the proper way of doing things, and then the pandemic ends, you know, the law probably ought to be standardized again. So um, I, I totally agree that we should not be suppressing the vote. And I think it should be easy to do. Um, and in most places it is. And I think I'd say the one thing that I would disagree with is states that have a absentee ballots that um, are not postmarked by um, election day. So, I mean, there, there's some simple things that I think we can do to standardize the process to make sure that every vote is is counted. Um, but we, it ought to be based on, you know, facts, because I know for a fact that voter participation, particularly in 2020, but certainly in 16 as well, is at an all time high, um, which is good. You know, it's the reason why if you're a Democrat, you, you loved it because there's two senators in Georgia that got elected uh, and Joe Biden carried a state that a Democrat hadn't won in, you know, I don't remember the last time. It probably had to be Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, I think. Yeah. So um, those laws that were supposed to be suppressing the vote turn out to have created a, a bluer uh, outcome in a state that traditionally was red. So. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Bianca. Let's invite in uh, Michael Hauser to ask uh, the final student question. Hi, uh, Governor Bush, thanks for your time. Uh, my question is about the role of religion in American political life and as it relates to democratic resilience. Uh, in the end of an opening statement you made at the Nexus Institute in the spring of 2016, uh, you said that in attempting to uphold democracy, we need to learn to be warm hearted again. And you said that our first impulse is to be more interested in others than we are in ourselves. And I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, in the United States, the cultivation of virtues like respect, kindness, generosity have often come from religious institutions. And that being said, uh, given that religious leaders still maintain an influential role in influencing political behavior, um, how can policymakers work with religious leaders to advocate for the preservation of democratic norms and institution in an age where denominational affiliation is as likely an indicator of political preference as any other demographic characteristic? Thanks. Wow. Um... That's a brilliant question. I'm not sure. I, you probably have a better answer on this than I do, but I would say, um, first of all, as a practicing Catholic, um, a convert. So um, I became a Catholic because my wife, I wanted to go to mass with my wife and my children, you know, to grow up in the Catholic traditions. I was a cheating Catholic. I, I go to mass, but I was an Episcopalian. So I went through the RCA process and it's, it was an important part. It is today still an important part of my life, my personal life. And I never felt like it shouldn't, it, it should always be an important part of my public life as well. That you don't put your deeply held uh, moral views that come from religious traditions in a lockbox. Um, and I think um, at least in the Catholic tradition, what you described as loving your neighbor, having compassion for those that have been left behind, uh, a sense of social justice, all of that is embedded in the Catholic traditions that have existed for many, many centuries. So um, not, all, uh, not all people of faith um, embrace that. They see, they see moral decline and they see, you know, they, they've, they've embraced people that frankly don't embrace their own faith. And that conflict, I'm not an expert on why it exists, uh, but I do think that um, it's a noble tradition in our country to um, openly express your faith in a way that's not like, you know, you're not casting judgment on others that don't embrace it, but uh, it should be allowed on the public square and that we should have free expression, including religious uh, faith. And frankly, if we did, um, the conversation that Michael and I had uh, prior to you getting, uh, coming on on the uh, on the video probably be easier to do because we would we would you know we could agree to disagree again we could um, recognize that uh, not everybody starts out in life the same way and that we have an obligation and duty to lift people up. There's a lot of things that whether you're a conservative or a liberal you could embrace. Uh, 
all of which are foundational aspects of religion and faith. So um, I hope you uh, stick with this in your in your studies, but more importantly, in your in, in the career to come. And I appreciate the service you've already provided our country. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Governor, we're uh, almost at the time, but I wanted to ask just one last question. You talked about at the beginning about the role your family played in, in teaching you public service, and you have clearly passed that down to the next generation. When you're thinking about our students at the Ford School and they're starting out their lives, uh, our undergraduates and our master's students going off into public service, what advice would you give to them? Um, I would, my first advice would be don't, don't automatically default to DC for public service. Uh, in fact, I would say in terms of policy, uh, you could gain your policy chops far quicker uh, in a more merit-based system, which would be local and state government. I mean, when I was governor, we were, it was a reform time. I mean, we were doing all sorts of things and I relied on younger people because I couldn't afford <laughs> the, the, the experienced people. We, we, you know, we have budget constraints and that's still to this day the case in, in most governments outside of Washington. And so I learned the skill of finding talent in people before they knew it. And so, you know, and, and now my alumni is comprised of people whose, whose life experiences I think were accelerated because they didn't go to DC. They became subject matter experts in fields that really are relevant for the rest of their lives. And they did that in ta little old Tallahassee. So uh, the first advice I would give is certainly that. And the second is don't, you know, don't veer off. You've, you've gone to a great school um, and you've done it because you want to serve in the public arena. Uh, don't be discouraged. Uh, in fact, you're needed. Um, I'm demanding that you stay involved <laughs> for the sake of our country. It's time for the old fuddy duddies to take, you know, leave the stage, frankly. Um, I'm not for term limits by age, but come on, man. I mean, people, People are just clawing for, you know, sticking around. And we need to let the next generation rise up in, in positions of responsibility. And so uh, graduates of the Bush School and College Station and the Ford School, the Kennedy School, I think can, can play a really constructive role in that regard, Michael. Thanks very much, Governor. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I know our viewers have as well, and I really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us at the Ford School. God bless. Thanks. Take care. See ya.